Good evening, everyone, and greetings. Welcome to our 2020 Virtual Mission Conference. We do hope that you can connect with us and enjoy all the wonderful sessions. It promises to be a great time in the Lord. You don't want to miss it. So stay tuned and stay connected. God bless you all. My name is Pastor Zachary Ibrahim from Foundation Baptist Church, Guyana, South America. And I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be a part of your missions conference this year. And I also want to thank everyone for their faithful investment in the Lord's work here in Guyana for over eight years now, prayerfully and financially. Please, at this time, let's all have a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your mercy and truth. Thank you for this day that everyone is coming together to serve you. And God, thank you, Lord, regardless of all that is going on around the world, you are still in full control over everything. Thank you for being the Lord of hosts. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Webster and Good News Baptist Church and their faithfulness to not allow the circumstances to stop them from having this conference. I pray, Lord, as they move forward into this conference, you'll bless the singing, bless the preaching of the Word of God. I pray you bless the decisions that everything that's being done will be done to honor you and worship you. And God, I pray that good decisions will be made this week here. And I pray more investments will be made into missions. Bless them, God. And I thank you, Lord, for their investment in the missions work here in Guyana for the last eight years. Thank you, Lord, for their love for the Guyanese people. And not just Guyanese people, but for the love of souls around the world to invest into missions. God bless them, help them and encourage them, and help them to have a wonderful service that will honor you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. And all God's people say, amen. Let's continue singing together. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod with the balm of his counsel or strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Here we go. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the power of his counsel, a strength to renew, let us do with our what I have had to do Hello and greetings to everyone in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Adrian Messiah. I am from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, I thank the Lord for who he is and what he has done in my life. I can remember being at the tender age of 10 
when I heard the gospel message and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. What actually happened that Thursday night was some of my neighbors, they were talking about going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior and they were very excited about it. I was very curious um, to know what they were going to do um, and, and they shared with me what that was all about. And um, I can remember we had a street meeting that very Thursday night. I, I went, I listened carefully to the gospel message. And I went to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. The scriptures were explained. My former pastor was preaching. And um, that night, things were so different. Uh, I can remember still attending um, believers' baptism classes. And um, during that time, I can remember making that commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My desire to follow him and to just walk with him um, each and every day of my life. I've been involved in the ministry from since then, really going through the ranks, um, youth meeting. Um, I've been heavily involved in that camp ministries. And um, when the Lord saw it fit, he called me to attend Bible College. And I attended Blue Water Bible College. Um, had a wonderful time there. Met some wonderful people, some wonderful professors who taught me so much about God and His Word. I am married to Jolene Messiah, and we have three children, Adrian Jr., Jediah, and Joe Rihanna. Um, the Lord has been good to us. He has been taking care of us. We thank you for being there for us. We have been here at, at Georgetown, St. Vincent, Biran Baptist Church, for almost 10 years now this coming september will be um 10 years since the lord would have called us we have had a, a wonderful experience it's a challenging experience in experience from time to time the lord has been good we have seen people come and go um but the lord has been blessing the work we are involved in so many things so many different ministries there is actually a ministry um at the church for every age group and we cater in, in, in discipling and evangelizing the sinners in, in really doing what God would have us to do here at the ministry. Um, we thank you, Good News, for being a part of our ministry. And we, we do appreciate it. We do love you. Continue to pray for us as we, we soldier on. Even in these challenging times, the Lord has been faithful to us. And um, we just want to continue to serve Him. He has been good. And um, we just want to encourage you as well. I just want to encourage you as well to just keep pressing on for him until he come. God bless you. And thanks for being a part of our life. Pastor Greg Mann. Greg and Wendy Mann have led a ministry in Guyana since 1999. Over the years, hundreds have been saved, baptized, and added to the churches. In all... 11 churches have been planted, and each of the churches today are led by men reached and trained through their ministry. Grace Ministries Guyana is located in the Northwest District, Region 1, more than 150 miles from the capital city of Georgetown. The ministry has spread through the remote Amerindian villages of the interior, reaching people of the Waru, Arawak, and Carib tribes. Large portions of the ministry locations are beyond the reach of the internet, creating real challenges in communication during this present crisis. And now we will have Pastor Mann. Well, let me say just a very blessed evening this evening to all my brothers and sisters there in St. Martin at the Good News Baptist Church. And, uh, well, I sure wished I could be with you this evening, and I know we'd all love to be together. And I believe that's going to happen, uh, Lord willing, and we're just going to gather together for a great celebration. But in the meantime, we're certainly not going to let the Lord's work be uh, hindered uh, as much as we possibly can. We're going to continue to preaching the Word and thank God for this mission's emphasis here. And I'd also like to send a word of greetings to my brothers and sisters across the islands in the Caribbean, uh, St. Kitts and Trinidad and St. Croix, St. Vincent, Grenada, and uh, obviously, and of course, what is in my heart tonight is the people, the dear people in Guyana. 
Um, we are not at this point, uh, my wife and I are not able to be in Guyana because of travel restrictions. Uh, but uh, so many good things are happening there in Guyana uh, through our ministry. We thank God for the leaders that we have there and the technology that, although it's very limited there, we do have some access to technology there that's allowing us to do uh, some ministry things there. So a couple things going on. Uh, each and every day, I'm sending out a short video that goes to our youth, uh, both uh, teenagers and young adults. And uh, those uh, are really starting to bear some fruit there and having some great conversations. So I take a, a scripture verse or two and uh, do a, about a five minute talk and send that to the youth there. And they're responding tremendously. Also um, sending messages every week. Uh, preaching and actually sometimes I'm able to do it live uh, with WhatsApp and uh, believe it or not we have one of our pastors there in the interior that'll hold up his phone and uh, I've been able to preach to small groups of people there and we go from home to home like that and in fact there's been Sundays where literally from seven o'clock in the morning till almost one o'clock we're still preaching from home to home uh, so what am I trying to say? We're just we're going to continue doing ministry. We're seeing people come to know the Lord. Uh, we're going to keep preaching the gospel. And by the way, no matter where you are listening from, I do pray this morning that uh, you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, this is the most important message that I can bring today. Um, in fact, I would be negligent if I didn't speak directly to you. Uh, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, if you're watching uh, somewhere in the world um, this video, and it may not even be on this Sunday, but sometime you picked this video out and you watched it. Oh, listen, I pray that you would understand how much God loves you, no matter where you are, no matter how far you have may have strayed from Him. Uh, can I assure you that there's a God in heaven who really, truly loves you, he loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die in your place because the Bible says that because of our sin, we deserve punishment, we deserve death. But Jesus, God's own Son, uh, died for us. And so we thank God that we have the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. And the Bible says this, it's so simple, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you uh, would like to have Christ as your Lord and Savior, to have your sins forgiven, to have a guaranteed spend eternity with God in heaven, then right now, right where you are, do just like the Bible says, to call upon the name of the Lord, and you can claim the promise from God, because God cannot lie, that if you call upon Him, Jesus said, all that come to me, I will no wise cast out. Uh, so come from wherever you are, from whatever you've done, and give your sin to Jesus and receive His righteousness. Believe by faith that He came to this world, He died for you, He was buried, but He arose again and He's alive and He can hear your prayer right now. Let's, let's have just a brief word of prayer before we get into the message. So our, our Father, this evening we are talking about a subject which is of great importance, I know, to you. Uh, the subject of world missions. And Lord, but before we get there, there may be somebody who has just heard that gospel invitation. And Father, I pray that they would have a, an understanding that the Holy Spirit could give to them and to their heart to see the lovely Lord Jesus Christ and that they might turn in repentance, that turning away from their sin and in faith, that is believing that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. That wonderful message that they may call upon you. But this evening, I pray for pastors. I pray for churches. I pray, God, for those that have been discouraged. I pray, God, for those that feel like the world is out of control. God, remind us again that you are sovereign and that you are God and that you are truly in control. So take our hearts tonight, God. Take our minds. Lord, help us to think on the things of God. Take our heart, Lord, and let it be the throne that you sit upon. Father, take our, our lips, Lord, and let us speak the lovely words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take our ears, God, and help us to hear the cry of those that need you the most. Take our eyes, Lord, and let us see the world as you see it. Take our hands, Father, and let us lift up the fallen and care for those that are hurting in our world today. And God, take our feet and shod them with the preparation of the gospel, Lord. May there be no nation, no boundary too far away that we would carry the gospel wherever you would enable us to do so. So, Father, open our eyes tonight in Jesus' name. 
Amen. In March of 1933, the German Reichstag passed the Enabling Act, which made Adolf Hitler the dictator in Germany. He launched a massive rearmament strategy from the earliest days of his power. Rival nations such as France and Britain adopted a policy of appeasement. The United States took the position that it was just simply not their concern. As Hitler saw the weakness in these nations, he took increasingly bolder steps to solidify and to expand his power. He became as a wild animal, devouring who, who and whatever he could, to the point that in September 1 of 1939, he ordered the invasion of Poland, marking the official start of World War II. Still, the United States took a position of neutrality. Famous citizens such as Charles Lindbergh advocated loudly for pacifism. Student movements, including future presidents Kennedy and Ford, spoke out against joining the war effort. Resistance to involvement or isolationism was born of three major reasons. In other words, these are the reasons why the United States adopted a position of being isolated from the world during these days. Number one, the horrific memories of World War I and just a strong aversion to getting involved in a foreign war. Number two, the average American was far removed from the people in Europe. Uh, remember those days, there was not the technology and, and access to communication and so on that we have today. And number three, most Americans felt that the battle was far away and it was really not their concern. As late as January 1940, one poll showed that 88% of Americans were opposed to joining the European war effort. Clearly, the United States was turning a blind eye to the millions of souls across Europe who were embroiled in a battle for survival and freedom. The Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor and other surrounding military installations in December of 1941 was the wake-up call that could not be ignored, and America then threw its power and influence into the war effort to free millions from tyranny and oppression. Now, why did I share that story? Well, I believe that there is a parallel spiritual reality happening in the church today. I, I see the church as being very passive when it comes to the war for souls around the world. There are literally billions tonight languishing in gospel darkness. And I believe that many of us, if not uh, in our minds, at least in our actions, we've adopted a isolationist approach. Um, and so I'm concerned about this. And maybe uh, it's because of our failed efforts in the past. We've tried something and it didn't work. Or possibly number two, I think this is a big one, we have a real disconnect with the people who live in heathen darkness. We're not communicating with them. We're not reaching out to them with the means that are available to us and the tools and traveling to them and visiting them and so on. And then number three, the distant fields of harvest are so far removed from our immediate church setting that we just believe that somehow it belongs to somebody else. And so many of the same reasons why America did not want to get involved in World War II, I believe the church is resistant to getting involved in the, the struggle for souls around the world. And the reality is that there are yet billions who are yet in gospel darkness. In fact, listen to some of these statistics. I think uh, this puts a, a picture on it. There are about seven and a half billion people on the planet today. And that uh, in terms of people groups, that would be 16,591 people groups now. Think of that as like ethnicities, uh, particular groupings of people, uh, uh, over 16,000 of them. Now, unevangelized or unreached people groups make up about one half of the world's population. So we're talking about almost 4 billion people would be categorized as unevangelized or unreached. Now, that doesn't mean that the other half are, are born again, but that simply means that about half the world has little or no access to the gospel. Imagine that today. They're not simply telling Jesus no, they just don't even know who he is. Uh, in fact, I've heard it said, and it's, it's very true, that across the Muslim world, that the average Muslim today has never even heard uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that they could understand. And we wonder why so many are clinging to a religion that seems uh, so, so wrong, and yet they've never heard the truth. So when we think about 
billions of people being lost, we might throw up our hands and say, so what can be done? Because we think of ourselves, we think of billions of people that we need to reach. We say that's too big of a number. But do you realize that there are about 900 churches, evangelical churches around the world for every one unreached people group? Or if you want to do it this way, there's about 78,000 Christians for every one unreached people group. Clearly, we have the churches and the manpower to address the, the gospel darkness in our world today. I, I, want, I want to say that clearly. It is a statistical fact that we have the manpower. We have the resources to literally saturate the world with the gospel. Uh, that's what these statistics would tell us here. On average, though, now these statistics I'm going to give you here uh, reflect mostly the American church, but I think this is largely true in the Western world. On average, Christians give very little to ministry efforts, but what is given, about 96.8% remain in the local church. That is about 0.3%, not 3%, but 0.3%. Is of our giving is going to the least reached peoples of the world. We're literally just dropping pennies uh, in, in our efforts to, to take the gospel where it's never been. In fact, about 95% of all vocational Christian uh, workers are, are laboring in reached areas of the world. Now think about this. All right, I'm going to wrap up these statistics because I know some of you are probably thinking this is too much, but I want to, I'm trying to give you some numbers here to think about this now. Think about this. If every evangelical Christian gave 10% of their income to global missions, we could easily support an additional 2 million new missionaries. 2 million. And now, what, what that would do is we literally would flood the world with the gospel. We literally could put missionaries among every people group, every nation around the world. We would flood the, the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ if we would just simply give 10% of our income to global causes. So clearly, there are a lack of resources, though, today and in terms of money and in manpower. And that's what I've been asked to speak about this evening is a lack of resources in both money and manpower. I'd like you to turn your Bible. First of all, we're going to address the issue of, um, of money, first of all, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to just give you a, a few things here that I want you to, to be thinking about and praying about. And I'm asking God to open hearts this evening um, as I present this truth to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're addressing now the lack of financial resources being uh, allocated to getting the gospel to where it's never been. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 would be a familiar passage to many of you. It's a chapter on giving, uh, what we would call grace giving, that is giving that goes beyond our tithe, that goes beyond, uh, just it's just simply an offering that we give up to God simply because we are in love with Him and we are so grateful for all that He's done in our life. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1 says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So first of all, if we're going to address this need of finances around the world, we have a need for knowledge. Paul says here to the church at Corinth, he said, I do you to wit. That is, I want you to know there's a lack of knowledge here. And specifically, Paul is, is singling out the, the idea of grace and that the uh, Corinthians were unaware of the power of the grace of God and how not only does that bring salvation, but it brings literal transformation every day of our life. And so there was a real need for these people in Corinth to understand the grace of God, a need for knowledge. Now, I believe that there is a great need, uh, not only for people to know the grace of God, but also uh, some things about missions. First of all, I think that uh, many of our churches and even some of our leaders are lacking in their understanding of God's view of missions. Not mine, not, not Pastor Webster, but, but of God's view. How does God view the world? And uh, so if you start in Genesis, you literally can go from Genesis to Revelation and you will find exactly how God feels about missions because it's in literally every book of the Bible. It is the central theme of the Bible of God's mission to the nations. Secondly, I think there's also a lack of knowledge uh, of the needs and opportunities. 
We're simply not talking about what is out there. And, and uh, I have a resource here that I printed out this week um, that uh, makes people aware of, of, of uh, people groups around the world and, and how to pray for them. And these, these resources are available online. There's so much available to us, but we're just simply not uh, giving this knowledge to people and, and taking it in and doing the research ourselves. We need to have a knowledge of where the needs are and where the opportunities are. And then I think also we have a, a need for knowledge of how to take those first steps. I think there are people that would serve as missionaries if they just simply knew how to take those first uh, steps. I think there's people that would give to missions if they just knew how to take those first steps. We ought to be challenging our people to give globally. And I know some of you are saying, well, well Pastor Greg, you just don't understand. There's, there's so much going on with this pandemic. Uh, but listen, I, I know, listen, God was not taken by surprise when this thing came. And uh, He's not just giving us a little pause in our Christian life. We ought to be aggressively seeking out ways that we can give and to expand the borders of the gospel to, to the ends of the earth. And let's not use excuses here. So there's a need for knowledge. There's also a need for priority. Uh, look at verse number two with me. The priority here. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Now, I love the way this verse is set up because you see their reality. The reality is, first of all, that they were in a great trial, but their response was abundant joy. Are you facing a trial right now? Are you, are you facing something bigger than yourself, bigger than the world? Well, of course, we are facing a trial right now. But what is their response? Abundant joy. Not just a little smile on their face, but there was a sense of joy in their giving. Secondly, we see that they were described as deep poverty. Uh, and then the corresponding reaction to that is liberal generosity. You know, my wife and I and my kids, we lived for many years there in the interior of Guyana, and that's where we're moving back to. And uh, we were often around some of the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere. But what I found is many of those people are some of the most generous people when it comes to giving. And I, I learned a valuable, powerful lesson from this that nobody is too poor to give. And I think we do our people wrong when we say to them, well, let me give you an excuse. Uh, you don't need to give, my brother or my sister. Oh, no. Listen, I challenge people in the depth of poverty to give liberally. So there's a need for priority. You see, when we prioritize missions, uh, suddenly things begin to change. And, and God somehow figures all this stuff out. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work in a, in a budget or in a balance sheet. But somehow, in the midst of all of this, when we make God's concerns our concerns and the priority, somehow God works it all out. So there's a need for knowledge. There's a need for priority. There's a need for urgency. In verses 3 and 4, we see that to their power I bear record. <coughs> Excuse me. Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty. This is literally, they were begging Paul, uh, take this offering. And, and, you know, Paul uh, apparently was a little bit resistant there. Maybe he felt like these people were too poor. And they were saying, no, Paul, please take our offering here. So praying us with much entreaty that we, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They wanted to be part of this offering, no matter how poor they were. Don't tell your people that they're too poor to give. Challenge them to be part of a global ministry. This is the urgency. You know, I did a little bit of math here before the message. And uh, uh, the number of people that die around the world, uh, did a little search on that, it comes out about 150,000 people die every day around the world. And that's a tragedy. Now think about this, if, if the world has about 6% evangelical population, that is people that believe that salvation is in Jesus Christ alone and by faith alone, and so about 6%. So what that means is that in the length of time that it takes me to preach this message, about 4,394 people will die not believing in the gospel of the Bible. That is 4,394 people in the time that I will be spending preaching this message, will die without Christ and go to a devil's hell. Now think about that. There's some urgency here. One of the things I think that the, the, the Western church has been paralyzed by is, is just a lack of urgency. In fact, if you were to take uh, your watch and just look at it for one minute, in the span of about one minute, 98 people 
on average, will be passing into eternity without Jesus Christ, without salvation. 98 people per minute every day of every week, of every month, of every year, on average. Now that tells me that there's an urgency. We don't have time to wait until somebody in the government tells us that the pandemic is over. Listen, we've got to challenge ourselves and challenge our people, and we need to be giving now to rescue the perishing and to care for the dying. And uh, listen, I'm not trying to put an extra burden upon anybody. I'm just simply wanting us to be biblical and obedient to God and to have a heart for the world and the nations. So there's a need for urgency in our giving. And finally, I think there's a need for personal surrender. We see in verse number five, personal surrender. And it says, And this they did, not as we had hoped, (laughs) look at this, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. So think about again, this whole passage is on giving. So before they gave their financial gift, they gave something even much more valuable. They gave themselves. You see, you won't wrestle with giving God resources in your wallet if you've already given him your life. And so this is what the the, the wonder of these Macedonians and how they set such a wonderful example that they gave themselves, Lord, here am I, send me. And and I'll tell you, once you've given up uh, your life, and by the way, remember what Jesus taught, that when we lose our life, we actually save it. But when we try to save our life is when we lose it. And so we see here the need for personal surrender. They gave themselves to the Lord before they ever gave a dollar. Have you given yourself wholly to God and God's causes uh, today? All right, so I want you to take now, let me just quickly give you those four things and then we're gonna move on. So concerning the issue of finances, we have a need for knowledge. We have a need for priority. We have a need for urgency. And we have a need for personal surrender. I'd like now for you to take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter number 9, and we'll finish out our message today addressing the need of manpower, the need of manpower. All right, so we're looking now at uh, Matthew chapter number 9, verses 35 through 38. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. I have often come back to this over and over again. It's so instructive to me. Uh, because Jesus here leaves such a beautiful example for our lives and our ministries here. And so there are four things, once again, that we need to address as we think about this need for adequate manpower for the global mission of God. All right? So let's start in verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues. By the way, I'm thankful right now that Jesus went to all the cities and villages You know, I'm thinking about where I was when I got saved, and I was not in a big city. I was not even in a place that uh, you probably can find on a map. I was in a very remote area when I got saved, but I'm thankful that Jesus doesn't limit uh, where he goes uh, just simply by, you know, well, it's a big city or there's, you know, plenty of people there. But he found me in, in literally in the middle of the wilderness. Literally, I got saved in the midst of the wilderness. Jesus found me because Jesus goes everywhere, every village and, and, and every city. And it makes me think about our ministry in Guyana. What a beautiful thing it is to go into those remote villages out there in the interior and bring the gospel because I know that Jesus is not just concerned about Georgetown and the capital cities of the world, but Jesus is concerned concerned about the cities and the villages, the small places where there's very, very few people. And so Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Uh, Interesting there that he was out healing sicknesses and diseases. Uh, And my, how we need to be out ministering to people as much as we absolutely possibly can. Jesus later sent his own disciples out uh, to minister to sick people of various diseases and sicknesses. And so thank God that the uh, Christian community has a place, has a role of ministering when people are hurting. But let's deal with this issue of manpower now. First of all, I want you to see the need for personal investment. You see, Jesus didn't just simply sit back and tell his disciples to go out and do something, but he personally invested himself. Now, let me speak for just a moment to the pastors that may be listening. 
Pastor, I, I urge you to lead by example, that you yourself need to invest yourself. Um, just recently, I had the opportunity to read a wonderful book uh, called Fire in His Bones. And this is the uh, biography of Oswald Smith. Oswald Smith was a longtime pastor in Toronto, Canada. Um, and one thing that Oswald Smith did, he believed in missions. In fact, he's the one that famously said, it's not fair for some people to hear the gospel twice when much of the world has yet to hear it once. But one thing I was so impressed with Oswald Smith as a pastor is that he did not simply sit back and watch the missionaries do the work, but Oswald Smith immersed himself in missions. His passion was to reach the world. And as a pastor, that bled out into the congregation and many, many people were sent out to the mission field and helped on the mission field. And many souls were won to Christ because one pastor had a passion for all the nations. So I urge you pastors uh, to get personally invested. Church member, I urge you to get personally invested. And I know right away you'll have some people that would resist and say, you know, I, I think that's the job of missionaries or pastors. Well, you show me that in the Bible. Show me where uh, there is an excuse given. No, no, church member, I tell you that the Great Commission was given to the church, which is comprised of every member. You have a responsibility to go and to make disciples. And, uh, uh, now, it may be that God hasn't called you to China. Maybe God has not called you to the other side of the planet, to India or some other place. But God has called you somewhere to make disciples. And so we need to get personally invested. And uh, we're so distant uh, so much of the time. I wonder if we took a survey in our churches of, of how long it's been uh, for some of us and how long it's been since we've led a soul to Christ. Oh, listen, we need to get back to the days when we're urging our people to win souls for Christ and to make disciples and pour our lives into others. That is why we're here. That is why Jesus left us here after we got saved. All right, so there's a need for personal investment. And please invest yourself in this. Don't Listen, don't just say missions is just for missionaries. Oh, no, missions is for God and God's people. And so invest yourself personally in it. Secondly, we see the need for informed compassion. Verse number 36, one of my favorite verses, informed compassion. It says, but when he, that's Jesus, saw the multitudes. Now I want you to notice this, that his informed compassion came from, number one, the fact that he saw the people. He saw them. He didn't just simply pass by and they weren't just an irritation on his schedule, but he literally took the time. In fact, the, the Greek word here that he took the time to focus in, he could see the hurt in their soul. You know, when's the last time that you looked into somebody's eyes and you literally could feel the pain? Uh, do we take the time to look at people the way Jesus saw them? And when he saw them, it's because he was close to them, right down the word proximity proximity. That is when Jesus saw them, he was close to them. We have to get out where people are. Don't sit in our offices, in our studies. Don't sit in our homes and, and just pray that maybe somehow that somebody will step into our church on Sunday. Oh no, we ought to go out into the highways and go out into the hedges and compel them to come in. And uh, oh, listen, we need to get back to the days when we're urging people to turn their life to Jesus Christ. And so we need to see the people where they are but Jesus, not only did he see the people, but I want you to notice that he understood the people. Watch this. And so when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. By the way, if you really have compassion, you can't help but move. Compassion, by definition, is something that moves you. It's a deep feeling in your heart that moves you into action. So he, he was uh, moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So three things he notes here, that they fainted, they, they had no strength, they can't get to Christ on their own. They're not just simply gonna wander in, they need us to go out because the Bible teaches us that when we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. So that when we couldn't pick ourselves up, Jesus is the one that picked us up. And listen, let us not think for a moment that a sinner is gonna pick himself up. We need to go out because they have fainted, and then it says that they were scattered. That is, they were thrown out like rubbish. They were just tossed aside. And that's what the world will do. Satan will, will destroy them and throw them away. And then sadly, they're living here, it says, with no shepherd. Nobody there to guide them. Nobody there to care for them. 
And this is the sad reality of billions of souls across our planet today, that they're not only dying without Jesus, but they're living without Jesus. They're living without a shepherd. And so we need to have a, 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 an informed compassion. Don't just sit back and shed tears from a distance, but it, get out there and see the people and understand the people. Thirdly, we have a need for clear vision. Look at verse 37. Jesus saw it clearly. He said, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. A couple things there. The opportunities are amazing. That's what Jesus said here. The harvest is truly plenteous. I know we normally look at it as a, as a problem. We look at it as an obstacle. But I say to you, it is an opportunity because the harvest fields are plenteous. Secondly, we see not only are the opportunities amazing, but the obstacles are small. What? Small? Oh yeah, look what Jesus said. But the laborers are few. You know, that's a simple problem to fix. The problem here that we see, the obstacle, is we just don't have enough people. But we do. The people are there. They're in our churches every Sunday. You're sitting there, um, you know, and uh, of course, now I realize you might be sitting in your home, but, there, but the body of Christ is still there. There are people there. And so Jesus said, it's quite simple. The obstacle is small. We just need more people who are sitting back and apparently not engaged in this. We need just people to step up and do what they're supposed to do, what they were saved to do. And, you know, we did really well uh, teaching people for years. I think our movement did really well teaching people, you know, to have the right uh, hairstyle and, the, you know, carry the right Bible and sing the right songs. And, you know, we had all the right convictions. But the problem was um, we, we won people to Christ, but we didn't develop them then to go out and to make disciples themselves. And we taught people that as long as you did all the right things and checked all the right boxes, that somehow that that equated with righteousness. But I tell you that Jesus pointed this problem out. It's a small problem. It just simply means that people that are sitting down ought to get up. People that are standing still ought to move forward. People that are just crawling along, they ought to be moving forward. They ought to be reaching people and making disciples and developing people and sharing the gospel and speaking the good news. It's as simple as that. So the obstacles really are small. So then we have number four, the need for mobilizing prayer. Look at verse 38. Here's Jesus, here's what he said when he assessed the situation. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. I say this is a, a mobilizing prayer. Why? Because it says that he will send forth labors into his harvest. You know, it's interesting that the thing that we can do uh, to solve the problem of a lack of manpower is something that we all possess. And yet, I wonder how many of us are engaged in this today. In other words, there is definitely a lack of manpower uh, on the mission field today. Uh, but the solution to it uh, is, is that we just simply need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. And I wonder how many are listening to me have the ability to pray. You know, a small child can pray. An elderly man or woman can pray. A, a young teenager can pray. A, a middle-aged man or woman can pray. Anybody at the prime of their life or in a sick bed can pray. It wasn't long ago that I was in a meeting preaching back in March uh, before everything kind of shut down. And as I was preaching, I looked back and there was a young man in a wheelchair there. And uh, he struggled to raise his hand during the invitation. And I went back to him and he, he could not uh, speak clearly. And uh, he obviously had some physical challenges. And, uh, but I began to speak to him and I said, you want to do something for God? He nodded his head. I took him to this passage and I said, young man, learn how to pray. You can literally have a global ministry through your prayer life. Pray. Uh, and that young man, tears began to flow down his face because he realized a truth here that oftentimes we can do more on our knees in prayer than we can any other way for the cause of global mission. Let me give you one quote here. This comes from E.M. Bounds, what a great man of God and wrote great books on prayer. He said, the key of all missionary success is prayer. The key is in the hands of the home churches. The trophies won by our Lord in heathen lands will be won by praying. This success be won by saintly praying in the churches at home. The key here, as E.M. Bounds said, and as Jesus said, is praying Christians. Are you praying mobilizing prayers. Are you praying for others to go? Are you praying for yourself to go? And this addresses the problem of manpower. So there you go. I pray and trust that these scriptures will help you. 
uh, to look at the issue of a lack of money and a lack of manpower. And I would say to you that God has a lack of neither. I think it's just a matter of us releasing those into the authority and to the sovereignty of our God, because our God has a wonderful, beautiful plan of reaching the world of all the nations. I challenge you there across the Caribbean. There are actually some unreached people groups living in the Caribbean. There are guest workers coming in from places like India and other places far away in Asia. These are unreached people groups. There are small pockets of them. But listen, you could actually have a, a ministry to unreached people groups even right there in your home island. So don't just look at your own people and say you've gone far enough. Look to the, to the world, to the harvest fields of the world, and I challenge you to greater things. God bless you, and I do pray for you. I pray for you regularly. Pray across the nations each and every day, and I pray for you. everyone. Thank you for streaming with us tonight. It has been great having you. We trust that your hearts have been blessed, and you will continue to connect with us tomorrow evening for our panel discussion. Good night and may God bless you all.